Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this session today. This is part of a series on vacuum system design and installation. Uh, this one entitled Sizing Rules. My name is uh, Matt Mari. I work for the Marketing Communications Department at Edwards. We're going to get started in just a second, but I did want to take a moment to note that this is the second in a series of three webinars we're giving. If you haven't signed up for the next and final in the series, you will receive a reminder with a link to sign up for that at the end of this session. Um, also, please feel free to visit the link at the bottom here of this slide uh, for future webinars to view the past recorded ones and learn more about what we do. Uh, please keep in mind you can enter questions into your webinar control panel window. Uh, these questions will be fed to your presenter, Andreas, at the conclusion of the presentation, so he can answer those. So um, now I'd like to hand this over to Andreas Kobus, who will be presenting today. Andreas is Edwards' business development manager for the process and steel markets. He has over 22 years of experience with vacuum technology for the chemical industry, having held various positions from systems and applications engineer to sales and business development. So with no further ado, Andreas, when you're ready, please take it away. Thank you, Matt. And welcome from my side as well to this second webinar in this series of Edwards of three webinars uh, focused to the, to the chemical and the process industry. Um, this session is uh, it's called Sizing Rules and Engineering Basics. What I want to go through with you today is um, show you some sizing parameters and how to determine vacuum system capacity. It comes from different angles and I would like to show you typically uh, from the process side uh, where these angles are. Uh, get you a little more uh, familiar with the pressure volume flow diagram, um, vacuum pump selection criteria and then I'll uh, just briefly dive into multi-stage vacuum systems. So uh, starting, I would like to start with a pressure comparison chart um, as, as shown here. Uh, the typical, um, typically used pressure units in the vacuum industry is either PSI, pump per square inch, inches of mercury, millibar or millimeter of mercury or TOR, which is the same. And I show you that uh, because these, I mean, there are there are other uh, pressure units out there uh, that I didn't mention here for a reason. I wanted to leave it to what's called absolute pressure units. That means, absolute means, the zero value of this unit is zero pressure. There are, there are units out there that, where that's not the case. And it is important um, for further, uh, and you will see that in the course of this webinar, that we, we use in order for sizing systems that we uh, stay in using absolute uh, pressure units. Uh, what's, what they have in common once they're all absolute is the pressure ratio, which is the standard pressure, which is the top line, the atmospheric or standard pressure, just the definition as standard is atmospheric. Everything below that or above that is actual pressure. And in order to convert one into the other, and to convert um, standard into actual units, you need that ratio. And uh, the beauty with these absolute pressure units is the ratios are keeping true to each other. So they, they keep the same no matter if you're in millimeters of mercury or in PSI. Um, the, if, you, if you build the ratio between standard and actual, they always get you to the same place. So let's talk for a moment about sizing a vacuum system. What, what's, what's driving it? What, what different angles are really to look at? So this is a picture from that I sort of borrowed from the first webinar showing a, a reactor a, a, and the, the way the vacuum pump is, is connected to it. I just kind of showed, uh, shown eventually you have a condenser between your vacuum unit and your reactor. So and the pressure gauge in millimeters of mercury on the left, that round icon there. So it may look familiar to those who uh, who joined the first webinar as well. So um, you have, we have different items or mass flows in that case, or that influence the sizing. Uh, one of course is the leak rate that is always there. There is no such thing like a reactor that doesn't leak. So so how to define the leak rate? I'm going to go there uh, in, a, in a minute. Then you have the reason why you're using uh, 
in a distillation or a drying process vacuum at all, you have an evaporation rate uh, of your solvent or the, the different solvents that um, that are supposed to distill off your product. So you're causing or forcing an evaporation rate by putting heating power to the liquid. And then there is potentially other gases like nitrogen, purge gases, other uh, re reaction products that just come off into the vapor phase. And as soon as they leave from the liquid to the vapor state, they become important for sizing the vacuum system. Um, what's driving it is the lowest desired pressure. So on continuous processes, of course, it's a constant pressure. On batches or drying processes, it's very frequently starting at atmosphere and then basically running down different rams depending on the uh, vapor pressure and the temperature and liquid states in the reactor over a period of time. So it's interesting to know what is the desired pressure, where is, when, at which point is the, the uh, reaction finished. The volume under vacuum can be interesting. And if you use a condenser, the condensation rate. So um, let's have a closer look to each of them. Um, before I do that, just sizing parameters. And, and, and that is a follow up of the last slide, basically saying, okay, what operating pressure is it? Uh, continuous or during the main phase. Is, there are diff two different operating pressures that are important for sizing. One is the one where you get basically dis a distillation of the bulk of the solvent that is coming off the reactor. And that is um, a vapor pressure thing. So it's temperature of the liquid and therefore the um, resulting vapor pressure that is determining that operating pressure in the main drying or the main distillation phase. And then there is the lowest operating pressure. So once the solvent is out of the system, the pressure goes down and therefore the volume goes up. So these two um, operating conditions are important. In both, you have an evaporation rate estimate. What, I'm, what I find frequently is um, that, that it's, it's kind of blurry what kind of heating power really goes into the liquid. It sometimes helps to um, just think of the total amount of solvent in pounds that, yeah, that are residing in your reactor and that, you, that are supposed to be distilled off in, off the reactor over the entire processing time. That gives you at least an average evaporation rate. And out of that average evaporation rate, it's sometimes and during, the main, during the main phase, of course, the most of the solvent comes off at, the, at this um, arrangement. So it can be two or three times on the peak of the uh, average evaporation rate, but then um, it's, it is easier then to say, okay, that's my average evaporation rate that is coming off the reactor over, over this supposed period of time of production is my heating power that is supplied to this reactor. Does that make any sense? So you basically start to put the puzzle pieces together to land on what is my evaporation rate really do? Volume under vacuum, is important for liquid, liquid estimates and pump down requirements and the temperature of the vapor at the pump inlet. That's where the temperature counts. Um, it helps also to have an idea what the temperature in the reactor is over uh, at which temperature the vapor basically um, arrives at the pump. Let's talk for leak rates for a moment. Um, there, is, there is a very helpful diagram that uh, the Heat Exchanger Institute publishes. And I've shown that here to you at an example. So basically the horizontal axis um, is the system volume in cubic feet. And the vertical axis shows you the maximum air leakage in pounds per hour. So it's, there's a chart there, it's a mass flow that you can read off. The different parallel lines are basically representing a building standard or a manufacturing standard of your reactor. Because it makes a difference if you, let's say, have a short path distillation or a white film reactor who's, that these apparatuses are built for operating on the vacuum. They have different welding standards, they have different uh, flange and uh, sealing standards, and they, they're just basically all trimmed to have a, a low re leak rate, while a regular batch reactor that is operated at 100 torr does not and doesn't need to. So uh, just to reflect this as a building standards, you can basically then say, okay, um, I'm operating in a certain pressure range. So you already 
most likely used to, to do leak tests um, and uh, leak checks before you before you run your print under vacuum so you get an idea under which building standards and seal snaps ceiling standards you are and you can then decide in which range the leak rate is most likely to be there are other ways to determine or even measure the leak rate uh, real quickly uh, if you're interested in those uh, just shoot me an email or something we can walk through this but it's also, it's always the same thing. It's always good to say, okay, I have measured the leak rate. The, the way measuring leak rates can be misleading. So having this diagram and say, does it make sense what I'm measuring here um, is very helpful. The other um, element, again, refers to webinar one. Uh, I picked a simple example here, isopropanol. So you have an we have an evaporation rate. Let's assume that liquid in this reactor is isopropanol at a temperature of uh, about 24 centigrade. And then consequently, the vapor pressure on the pressure in the reactor cannot get lower than 40 millimeters of mercury because that's the vapor pressure of isopropanol at that temperature. So again, that's referring to what I said earlier. But at this constellation at this temperature of the liquid and that pressure applying heating power means this is driving an evaporation rate so how does that look like let's go directly to what the sizing how sizing would work so out of the uh, heat exchanger diagram i just assumed it's a thousand cubic feet reactor it's just taking an example and I'm landing at 10 pounds power of, of air, that's the leak rate. And then I'm just assuming you have enough heating power to generate an evaporation rate of the isopropanol at 40 torr of 50 pounds per hour. Okay, so this reactor, this reaction is, is delivering mass flows, pounds per hour. So all we need to do right now is to apply the mole weights. Air, the mole weight of air is 29, the mole weight of isopropanol is 60, and divide it by with the with the so you take the mass flow and divide it by the mole weight, and what you land is a mole flow. And without exactly explaining what that is, it's it's now it's basically we're starting to go on the bridge from calculating from a mass flow into a volume flow. And um, the, the, the number that you just need to um, write down somewhere or just keep, keep memorizing, it's the always same number as long as you calculate in pound per hour um, under standard conditions, which means, as I said earlier, 760 millimeters, 14.7 PSI, 29.9 inches of mercury at that pressure and at 32F, zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin, one pound mole of gas has the always same volume and it occupies a volume of 359 cubic feet period that's the magic number so if you if, once you have that you just add the whatever the mass flow is that you that you're just calculating in your reactor it's air it's a, it's a certain amount of monitor chain it could be in this case it's 10 pounds of air and 50 pounds per hour of ipa divided by the mole weight Add the mole flows and divide it by 60 because you we calculate the mass flow in pounds per hour. And um, these the, the basically the, the volume unit that we want to land on is standard cubic feet per minute. So you turn the hours into minutes and dividing it by 60, and then just uh, multiply the value with 359, 359 cubic feet per pound mole use. So this example in this example we land at seven standard cubic feet per minute and that's a firm ground to stand on from here on you will see very quickly uh, where this goes standard cubic feet per minute is basically the volumetric equivalent of the mass flow at standard conditions atmospheric pressure and 32f temperature actual cubic feet per minute that's actually where the vacuum pump is this, that's already the design point for the vacuum pump. That's where the, the vacuum pump comes in. Its size is simply then standard cubic feet per minute, corrected 
by two values. One, instead of the standard pressure, we need the actual pressure. And instead of the standard temperature, we need the actual temperature. So that's how you basically correct standard cubic feet per minute into actual cubic feet per minute. And this, in this case, in the lower uh, line that you see in this box, ACFM is basically the seven SCFM that we arrived at. I, I calculate in total millimeters of mercury, 760 divided by 40. Remember at 40 tor, that's the vapor pressure of IPA at the temperature that I picked. That's, that's why I, I use this pressure. That's the best pressure you can accomplish. So your evaporation rate and your leak rate, both basically then take the volume at the pressure in the reactor that you can accomplish in that 40 tor. Here's, here's the important thing that I said earlier. You can use absolute values. You can use PSI. And then it's 14.7 divided by some, some the equivalent of 42 in PSI. The ratio is the same with absolute values. So I, I just like millimeters of mercury. If you like PSI or inches, you can do this calculation as long as you stay in absolute values. The ratios stay the same. 7 times 7, 60, 40. And the temperature, please, same thing. The temperature needs to be in absolute values. Means again, zero, the zero temperature is absolute zero. There are only two temperatures that I know that fulfill that. It's Kelvin or Rankine. So 273 Kelvin is 32F. So um, you, with the temperature correction, watch out for that. That's important. Uh, it, um, I use Kelvin. Um, to, to do that. You land at 146 actual cubic feet per minute. That is the volume that the 50 pounds of IPA and 10 pounds of air or seven standard cubic feet per minute in total, that's the volume that this flow occupies at 44. This is why this pressure ratio is so important. I'll come back to that. So that's the first and the most important step to do because you land on actual cubic feet per minute and that's actually your pump size or the, the, uh, the size needed for your, for your vacuum system. This is a single point reference and then we can go into this pressure volume uh, speed, uh, capacity diagram and do two things. One is, uh, so the horizontal line is the pressure, again, in millimeters of mercury. The vertical line is the capacity, the volume in actual cubic feet per minute in CFM. So there are two things to look at. One is, I, I chose an example here, uh, one of our liquid ring pumps, the EHR 2390. Just a, that is the orange performance curve of a pump. You can see that over a a certain pressure range, that performance curve has a constant capacity. Vacuum pumps are typically volumetric machines, which means they have a constant volumetric capacity over a certain pressure range. Your mass flow that we discussed earlier, the 50 pounds of IPA plus 10 pounds of air, behave different in this diagram. They are just a straight line. And that straight line has always the same slope. Um, but you, what you can read from that is, is again, uh, very simple. It's one, one reference point, so you can place that line at 40 millimeters of mercury and 146 ACFM. That's where the green bars just cross the mass flow here. And you move from there just using pressure ratio. Okay, so you have 146 ACFM at 40 millimeters. If you want to go to 10 millimeters, the ratio is... 146 times 40 per, divided by 10, which is four. At 10 millimeters of mercury, that means nothing else than your pump needs to be four times bigger. And that is what in, in, the, in the vacuum um, world drives the size of the pumps. Why it's so important to, to know at which pressure you wanna land and how which kind of mass flow you're pumping and at which pressure, because it is, um, it is important to understand that every time you cut, you, you basically want to cut the pressure into half, you need to double the size of your pumps. Um, in, this, in, in this case, and this mass flow. So just for um, 
to be complete with that. So in this diagram, to, for your better understanding, mass flow up and down, so higher mass flow, you have more evaporation rate. Let's assume 50, 50 pounds per hour of IPA go to 100. This mass flow just moves parallel up. And, and you see then how the crossing point of the mass flow to your pump shifts the, the, the potential pressure that the pump can give you. Um, by shifting the mass flow up and down. And of course, with lower mass flow, the pump's getting better. The point where this mass flow crosses the capacity curve of the pump is your best operating point. This means, as I said earlier, if you want it in this case, you see this here, click this back, you see this is 30 millimeters of mercury. It's the best point this pump can give you at that, at that example. So discussions that lead to, well, we would like to see 10 millimeters of mercury means you need a three times bigger pump. The liquid ring pump that I chose here as an example would not get you there. The, every operating pressure underneath the performance curve is possible for this machine. Um, the, the place where the mass flow crosses the, the um, capacity curve of the of the pump is the best pressure that pump can give you so it always goes better pressure always goes with more capacity and th that is important too because I, I chose another example a, a, a dry pump out of our ranges an EDS 300 dry screw pump similar capacity than the liquid rain pump that I chose but dry, dry pumps cover a way larger capacity range or pressure range as shown here you can see this orange line is going almost across the entire um, range of uh, pressure, inlet pressure, from atmosphere down to 0.01 millimeters of mercury. But still, the mass flow crosses that line at that capacity. This pump is, would not be able to get you a better pressure, although it pulls um, over a much larger capacity range. The only way to get there is to get a bigger pump. To put a bigger pump in. Okay. The other way to get there is to put a second pump on top, a blower, a roots blower in that case, and that makes it a pumping system. And I'll come back to that. In a lot of cases, it makes a lot of sense to then move into a system instead of putting just a bigger pump in. Because you can see the mass flow, again, covered everything under the curve under and beneath the, the, uh, the curve, the mass flow is being handled fine. So the blower only kicks in or it develops the capacity that you need with lower pressure. And of course, that works with a blower on top of a liquid ring pump as well. And then in that case, the blower would even uh, get to a pressure in your system at 10 tor as shown here that a liquid ring pump on its own would not get to by uh, by condition by its principle. I mentioned in the webinar one uh, that a condenser is a vacuum pump. I didn't want to leave this unmentioned here. So how does a condenser work as a vacuum pump? Which capacity does it have? So it works the same way. I again pick the same example: 50 pounds of, of isopropanol evaporation rate. 10 pounds of air stay the same. And just using a condenser with, I, I used 15 centigrade somewhere, uh, 40, 45 f cooling water over the temperature in the reactor. Um, it, it derives, it arrives at the condenser knocks out 30 pounds per hour out of the 50 that comes over your reactor, 30 pounds per hour, the condenser just knocks out. And that is, uh, you can deduct that from your mass flow because the moment it condenses, the moment the vapor turns back into a liquid, it's out of the system. It's not any more interesting for your vacuum system. And, and that makes, as I said in uh, the first webinar, that makes a condenser a vacuum pump. In that example, if you, if you do that and uh, run 20 pounds per hour IPA, you end up at 80 with the same uh, this, this, with the same calculations that I did earlier. You end up at 80 ACFM, quite substantially less um, pump size because your condenser 
does the job. And that still is only scratching the surface if you if you have um, massive amounts of uh, condensable liquids coming over, and they are uh, massive, so 100, 200 pounds per hour of whatever, and you have tiny leak rates, your condenser is getting ever better. And it's, it can be shown in this diagram that I've uh, that I've shown you earlier. In as I said, you, the condenser takes the mass flow out, so it moves the mass flow. That is then its volumetric equivalent, like like we said, the ACFM is moving to the pump. It moves the mass flow down. One last aspect of sizing is pump downs. I've seen those um, from time to time that pump down time is is or can be an issue with large reactors, which which frequent shifts of multi batches leak tests uh, that that need to run in a certain time. So I just wanted to not leave it unmentioned. Uh, this is the pump down uh, formula. So you be basically the capacity you need is the volume under vacuum divided by the time you want to have it pumped down, and you then take the uh, ratio of the start pressure divided by the desired pressure when your pump down uh, stops, and take the national log net, uh, the uh, the logarithmus, uh, the logarithm, do you logarithmize it? In this example, again, a thousand cubic feet. Um, I just said my at the pump down to 42 in 30 minutes. You need about 100. It's 98 ACFM. That's what it's what this comes from, and th that's where it lands at. So you you already see. Okay, that's less than 100. We had before our sizing our sizing uh, examples landed at a somewhere 146, 150 ACFM pump size. So the pump that you choose covers that demand. So I hope that gives you an idea um, about how how to how to size the vacuum system over to to support the reaction that you're doing. And since in the process industry particularly, um, there is a relatively large variety of pumps because of the challenges that the the process industry. Um, offers. So, particularly Edwards has therefore all the, the uh, relevant technologies available and there's plenty of options to choose from. So the question is which one to choose. So I was thinking about this, give you some, some ideas in which directions um, the, the technologies move. Now, but before I do that, you can see already again on this on this chart here the different pump types technologies if it's a wet pump which i marked blue here you know, or a dry pump which i marked yellow here and in my webinar 3 i'm going to go in more depth about the difference between the two but for now just just know a wet pump needs a service liquid in its pump chamber whether it's oil or liquid or water or Whatever service liquid is is um, compatible to the to the production that you're running, they always need a liquid. And while dry pumps don't, they uh, they have a they're technically different. They're contactless machines. Um, so, but still, all the pumps, all the so-called backing pumps, and with blowers without the systems, cover the same pressure range. So. What are the selection criteria then? So, out of the experience that I that I have gathered over over decades with this, I came up with a lot of them. But I marked those, highlighted those that I think where it comes down to. So, installation and uh, so what pump to choose? Installation environments, power consumption, type of agent. Yes, it's all important. What kind of? This is why. We keep asking a lot of questions as much as we can learn about your process to help you right, um, um, choosing the right pump. But what it comes down to is really, besides the capacity required, it's the capex and operating cost. It's, it comes down to money. It's, it, there's, every pump can be made 
functional in almost every process. It is about what is the most economic choice. So I, I just picked some some ideas for you to, to look at when when it when it doesn't make sense economically to select a liquid ring pump. So liquid ring vacuum pumps are, are single shaft machines. You all know them. They're in, in the market for more than 100 years. Um, available in large capacity ranges, in various materials, um, compatible with service. Uh, uh, they're possible to operate them in, uh, with compatible liquids to the production. They're cool operating machines. Uh, so they have a low te operating temperature, uh, and the condens condens they, they just act with like, a, like an inlet condenser. They have condensation effects that can help a lot um, to, to size the pump without uh, putting a condenser in, for example, because it's, it is already having a condenser in it or a condensing principle. Um, on the other side, it's a limited pressure range. It's very interdependent with the service liquid conditions and process agents. Um, it produces a high waste flow and an elevated motor power consumption. They're not the most efficient machines when it comes to electrical motor power and the compressor. So typically it lands at a large scale production unit, uh, preferably in continuous operations, relatively rough vacuum levels. Um, it, you find uh, the, the liquid ring pump makes a lot of sense in handling um, agents that are challenging for other type pumps. I just picked a few examples, fatty acids, polymer resin products, bulk petrochemical products. Um, this is typically the domain of liquid ring pumps. I uh, just picked another example, um, uh, dry pumps. They come almost from the other angle. Uh, broad pressure range, zero interdependence with process conditions and agents, no need for accessories, zero waste flow. So you can see this already coming down so that why these pumps A coexist, um, B sometimes replace each other. And um, it's it's as I said, it's the, the choice is usually being made of what makes the most economic sense in the environment that you're looking at. I um, so I, we're typically uh, finding these pumps, and Edwards pioneered this technology in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and ever since was leading this technology into this industry, typically in specialty chemical size product production units, multi-purpose production arrangements, um, different agents, light boiling solvents, where liquid ring pump is really starting to, uh, well, um, being providing a relatively unstable vacuum, while dry pumps always have a stable capacity curve, no matter what agents they're pumping. They're also very good in handling corrosive agents um, and, and, and in hazardous environments. That leads me to the last section of, uh, of this webinar today. It's coming back to multi-stage vacuum systems. And I introduce you to the same diagram that I've shown you earlier, pressure over um, capacity, ACFM over millimeters of mercury. And I choose, I chose the same, I'm, I'm moving in the same example that I used earlier. So we saw that before and uh, we said, okay, so the decision whether, you, whether it makes sense to run the entire capacity need at the desired pressure with one pump or with a system has a lot to do with the capacity that you need and the pressure that you want to accomplish. I've shown you one of the large Edwards um, skids from the from the large roots blower on the right through an interstage blower into on the left a um, CDX 1000 dry screw pump. This this is basically the the idea where you where you come into systems because it just doesn't make economic sense to if you look at the blower on the right this is almost a 10,000 ACFM blower um, to provide that capacity in in a backing pump when you can use a blower and another blower and basically stage the system so it arrives at the at the right pressure at the right capacity without having a, a range of pumps with an enormous um, electrical motor uh, power consumption 
just to get to the same point, which makes the root blowers as the as a booster pump for those applications to make it a vacuum system so important. And again, the, the rotary lobe type blowers are in this market for the last, I don't know, 80 years. Um, I, I keep seeing that the, the limitations of the roots blowers is a constant discussions in our, in our calls, in our uh, discussions with customers in this industry. So I thought I'd give you um, the, the relation what, where the roots blower makes sense and why it is so important to make that decision when you want to go with a blower and in which pressure range it is. So I picked just a blower on the right. So the principle is clear. It's a rotary lobe. So on the inlet on the top, the discharge is on the bottom. And this pump basically just has these lobes that rotate one counterclockwise, the other one clockwise. And it kind of shovels gas from the inlet to the discharge. It's not a compressor in that sense. Just a, a, a big machine that has a lot of capacity and it moves it from the inlet to the discharge while the dis at the discharge the pressure is elevated. And the reason why the pressure is elevated, and this is why I've shown you this volumetric ratio on the left side, the pressure is elevated because the root blower progresses or compresses gas into the next stage and the next stage is typically volumetrically smaller than the, the blower itself which means that defi defines the compression ratio, it's called, of a root blower. In this example, a 1000 ACFM blower compresses into a 200 ACFM pump is a compression ratio of one to five. So again, that's, like we said earlier, it's just now we, we're looking into ACFM and pressure, pressure ranges. So on a one to five pressure ratio, the discharge pressure of the blower is five times bigger than the inlet pressure of the blower. And since pressure times surface area or surface is a force, you can see that the bigger the blower gets, the pressure force that is acting radial on the rotors and radial on the shaft is getting excessive, depending on in which pressure range the, the blower is acting. So when you design, when we design systems, it is, it is just important in which pressure range a blower is acting. So I picked this example from the left to the right, same pressure, same staging ratio, 1000 ACFM to 200, which means the compression ratio of this blower is one to five. If you operate it at an inlet pressure of one torr, it compresses to five torr, and the delta P, the pressure difference between inlet and discharge that dominates the the compression force is four torr, which is almost nothing uh, and, and very easy to handle. If you operate the very same arrangement at 10 torr inlet, the blower pushes to 50 torr and your delta P is 40 torr, which is on the, on the edge of what a blower typically can take. And if you move it to 50 torr, um, your discharge pressure of the blower is 250 and your blower is in major trouble. Um, it cannot handle such a 210 pressure difference, 210 millimeters of torque uh, or torque uh, pressure difference and would typically then need a VFD to spin down or um, like Edwards offers uh, viscocoupling, hydrokinetic couplings to prevent that from happening. So the blower would always stay in a healthy range but it would not run full speed, it cannot. It cannot maintain that pressure difference. And that is, that is important to know, I felt, for you to, for you to know that these, these pressure ranges, that delta P of a, of a system when you build vacuum systems is just important. The delta P, of course, can be shown here as well in this diagram. In this example, the delta P is just constant mass flow inlet on the orange line. That's where your vacuum system offers you the capacity that you need. That's the operating pressure and the blower pushes actually the, the, the mass from the inlet to where the mass flow crosses the blue line, which is 
the pump underneath. It's called the backing pump. And the backing pump is by definition the pump, the vacuum pump that discharges to atmosphere. If you move the mass flow down or to the left into a different pressure range, you can already see that um, blowers, back roots blowers in that pressure range are much more efficient and can handle much more pressure ratios in that pressure range. So pressure range and capacities for blowers is what's driving the design of a system. So at this point, I am finished with what I wanted to convey to you. Thank you for listening. I hope that my presentation gave you an idea how sizing rules are going, what to look at. Um, just if you, if you have any questions um, in this call or later, send me an email. We would be uh, more than happy to answer this, to contact you and just walk you through the, um, the answers and the items in sizing vacuum systems. I put my, um, I put on my video system so you can, I hope you can see me and um, get back to Matt and I'm open for questions. Thank you again for listening. Thanks, Andreas. Yeah, we have a few questions here. So um, the first one is from Kumar. Um, first question, is flame is a flame arrestor required in vac on a vacuum pump even if there is high efficient condenser upstream of the condenser? And two-part question, also how does post-vacuum condenser affect the efficiency of the vacuum pump? Okay. Um, Thank you, Kumar, for the question. So flame arresters in the US are usually not required. Um, they are, um, I've seen them very rarely. Different story in Europe. Um, the, the, the pumps the pumps are built for NEMA standards in the US for, for hazardous area and classified areas. Um, flame arresters also have a, a disadvantage when you want to go to deep vacuum. They, they are a major, uh, they have major pressure losses. So um, this is this is one part of the answer. So the short one is no, a flame arrestor would not be uh, would not be required in the U.S. Um, the a discharge heat exchanger or discharge condenser doesn't directly affect the capacity of the machine of the pump. It would. It's sometimes very helpful because um, a vacuum pump whatever is in the vapor state, what it pulls in on a low pressure is usually, that's the reason why you use the vacuum distillations, it's usually condensable on the discharge of the pump. And since the, as soon as the, the mass flow, the vapor mass flow leaves, leaves the, the vacuum pump, it cools down very quickly and starts to condense. So um, if, if, if your emission control, if you, if you want to control the emissions, uh, which means whatever discharges from the vacuum pump, wherever that goes, uh, a, a condenser makes sense on that side. It's very efficient, but it would not affect in that sense, like a inline condenser, the capacity or the sizing of this vacuum system. I hope that answers your question, Kumar. Thanks. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Jay. How is the system brought to the pressure uh, that the blower can handle. Uh, that that's actually a good question. That is um, so that meanwhile the blowers that are available that Edwards builds are um, two ways. You either have like the hydrokinetic coupling or a VFD that I mentioned, and then you would be able to uh, start both pumps, the backing pumps and the blower at atmosphere, and just let the system pump down. The blower would basically then speed up the lower the inlet pressure gets. So the more the blower gets into its sweet spot for best working ratio, uh, pressure ratio, it would speed up um, through the VFD or the or the coupling because it's that's the uh, compression power that limits it. Um, otherwise, I, I know this from from the past. There there are there were it was always an issue. Uh, you usually start your backing pump first, 
pump down until the backing pump reaches a level in your reactor that allows the booster to kick in. Um, that's also a way to do it. Great, thanks. Uh, another question, would you use the uh, local barometric pressure for the pump down formula if above sea level? That's the next question. The pump down curve? Yeah, the starting pressure is different. It's a good question, actually. Um, 760 is, is, in that case, the 760 torque. I hope I understand that question right. The formula that I shown for the pump down, is I put the 760 millimeters in as sea level or standard pressure. If you are above sea level on high elevation and you only have 600 torque atmospheric pressure, that's a different starting pressure. So instead of 760, you put in your, your um, ambient pressure from from the point it's pumping down and it changes it to to your paper great thanks um another question uh for roots blowers uh the thought is the size criteria is more related to compression uh ration not volume um in the example all three cases had some ration and the ideal is considered four to one and extreme and operating is 10 to one that is the question yeah it's it depends i, I was choosing uh, the example on a on purpose uh, with the same one to five pressure ratio where you typically find blowers working just to make sure in that ratio if you move the blower into different um pressure ranges it is a different game for a blower. If you if you run it in rough vacuum, one to five is too high. You can sometimes end up with a staging ratio of one to two. So if you run it at 50 tor, your blower, uh, your your backing pump needs to be, uh, your blower is only twice as big as your backing pump. While when you go into one tor range, your blower can be 10 times bigger than your backing pump. So the staging ratio, I know there's uh, a lot of, um, information flying around it can be one to ten or one to four or one to two it's solely defined by what is the maximum delta p the blower can take and then you if you run it at one tour and your blower is 10 times bigger than your backing pump one tour inlet length gets you 10 tour discharge which is fine the, the pressure difference is nine tour every blower is happy with that it can even be higher it can be one to 20. so um it depends on in which pressure range you're operating it and then do the, just simply the um, pressure ratio. Look at the pressure ratio in your staging, and you can basically follow from which point to which point your your blower compresses, and what is the delta p. Great, thanks, Andreas. Um, so I think this is a conclusion of our presentation. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. We hope you'll join us for our third and final in the series. Um, this and thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>